we're getting ready to move into some fairly sophisticated models for how electrons behave in molecules. And to understand these molecules, we need to revisit molecular orbital theory, which is an extremely important bonding theory that describes electrons within molecules. The signature idea of molecular orbital theory is that electrons are delocalized. They're spread over the entire molecule. We describe that spread using essentially a probability distribution for each electron. And we can combine those individual probability distributions to come up with a full probability distribution for all of the electrons in the molecule. And that's what we call psi. And this is what's known as the wave function. We can also talk about individual electronic wave functions. And we'll have more to say about those in a second. According to the quantum mechanical model of the atom, which defines some function that operates on psi to produce the energy of the atom, that operator, which is called the Hamiltonian operating on psi, is equal to the energy of the atom times the wave function. So computers, for example, can figure out the Hamiltonian and solve this problem to identify both the wave function and the associated energy values telling us both where the electrons are located in space and what their energies are. And this energy value actually gives us very important practical information about the reactivity of electrons in a molecule or the ability of an unoccupied wave function to accept one or more electrons into it, so to speak. So unless you go on and take a course in quantum chemistry, you'll never actually solve the Schrodinger equation. Our key goal here, and in the sections that follow, is to understand how to interpret the electronic wave functions, lowercase psi, and the energies that come out of solutions to the Schrodinger equation. We want to do this because molecular orbital theory is the most accurate theory to describe delocalized bonding, both in large-scale materials such as metals, where we have a sea of electrons or semiconductors where a similar situation applies, and even in small molecules where delocalized bonding is important, such as in cases where resonance structures come into play. So MO theory is really a bonding theory like any other describing the nature of electrons and atoms. But as we just alluded to, the power of molecular orbital theory comes in when we need to describe delocalized electrons or delocalized bonding. Electrons involved in delocalized bonding cannot be described by localized bonding models like valence bond theory, Lewis structures, and other simple models like those. Now, the Schrodinger equation looks fairly simple, right? It's just some operator operating on the wave function is equal to the energy value times the wave function. However, there's a ton of complexity that's buried in this Hamiltonian operator. And so the solutions end up being very complicated. And in many cases, depending on the complexity of the system, we actually can't come up with analytical solutions. We have to use approximations, usually driven by the computer program we're using, to come up with solutions that fit this equation approximately. Although we use the computer to apply the approximations, the conceptual basis of the approximations is actually really important to understand, because it allows us to, again, achieve this goal of interpreting the solutions of the Schrodinger equation conceptually. Where we tend to start with this is with some input structure whose formula is known. And for each of the atoms involved in the structure, we know that there are atomic orbitals associated with these atoms. These can be calculated for the individual atoms to a very large degree of accuracy. And this is essentially where we start. So we can think of atomic orbital wave functions for each of these three atoms. Let's call them psi a, psi b, and psi c. And we can build the molecular wave functions using linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. And linear combination is just a fancy term for we're going to scale the atomic wave functions and add them or subtract them. Think of it like a recipe. Each molecular orbital contains a little bit of the constituent atomic orbitals. And this is how we build in the delocalization, because when we throw in a little bit of psi a, which is localized on atom a, and a little bit of psi c, that's localized on atom c, and maybe even a little bit of psi b, which is localized on atom b, we end up with a sum that is spread over the entire molecule. And the magic of quantum computational programs is that they tweak the amounts of each atomic orbital 
going into each MO to produce a final result that's consistent with the Schrodinger equation. A great analogy for this linear combination of atomic orbitals method to produce molecular orbitals is to just think of each molecular orbital as being described by a recipe. For a diatomic molecule like H2, each molecular orbital is going to be composed of a contribution from each of the two atoms in the molecule. Let's call them HA and HB. So for example, HA has a 1s atomic orbital on it, and HB also has its own 1s atomic orbital. And we can think about combining these in two ways to produce two molecular orbitals. We need to produce two molecular orbitals, by the way, because the number of atomic orbitals input needs to equal the number of molecular orbitals out so that we end up with enough molecular orbital slots, if you will, enough orbitals to fill in the maximal possible number of electrons that the molecule could contain. In any event, we could imagine combining these in a constructive way, 1s plus 1s, to produce an orbital where there's reinforcement between the two nuclei and we end up with a single orbital with all the same phase, that is, all the same color, all the same sign of the wave function, say, positive, right? If we subtract the two orbitals, we end up with a situation where now the two lobes have opposite signs and we end up with a region between the nuclei where there is no wave function density at all. In other words, the value of the wave function is zero. In this situation, we have one positive lobe and one negative lobe of wave function. Let's actually see what this looks like in the results of a WebMO calculation. Here's an image of dihydrogen on the left, and on the right, I have the WebMO output. And we're going to focus especially on this eigenvectors table within the output for reasons that will become clear in a second. The two molecular orbitals of this molecule are listed here, and if I select MO1, we can see that shape that we just discussed in which the two 1s orbitals having the same sign add together to produce a, a sort of blob where the entire orbital has the same sign of the wave function. That is, it's all positive, let's say. The eigenvectors table list the molecular orbitals in the columns, they're eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, which is a fancy way of saying they're solutions to the Schrodinger equation. That's why the word eigenvectors appears here. Important point is that the columns are the molecular orbitals. Each column is like a recipe, and each row is like the ingredient atomic orbitals. So we have the 1s orbital on the first hydrogen, hydrogen 1, and the 1s orbital on hydrogen 2 here in this table. These numbers are the coefficients on each atomic orbital. In other words, the amounts of each ingredient. We can describe this orbital in equation form by writing that the molecular orbital, let's call it psi1 since it's molecular orbital number 1, is equal to some coefficient on hydrogen atom 1 for the 1s orbital times that 1s orbital wave function plus a second coefficient on hydrogen 2 for its 1s orbital times the 1s orbital on hydrogen 2. So again, this looks a little bit complicated, but it's basically just the mathematical form of a recipe. Here's the amount to use. Here's what to throw in for hydrogen 1. Here's the amount of the second ingredient to use, and here is the second ingredient in mathematical form for hydrogen 2. These coefficients, C11s and C21s, are listed in this table. And so we can see for hydrogen 1, we have a coefficient of about 0.7. And for hydrogen 2, we have a coefficient of 0.7. And it's important that they're both positive. The fact that they're both positive tells us that the two orbitals overlap in such a way as to produce constructive interference in the middle of the orbital. In other words, the orbital density is larger in the middle since we're adding together two positive wave functions. If we transition to orbital 2, what we notice is that now we have two lobes of opposite sign in this orbital. We can still represent orbital 2 using an equation with similar form, now saying that psi 2 is equal to some coefficient on hydrogen 1 for the 1s orbital, where this is for MO2, I'll just put a, a 2 in parentheses out here to imply that, times that same 1s wave function for hydrogen 1 plus 
an equivalent term for hydrogen 2, where we include, again, the amount to throw in there, that's this coefficient for molecular orbital 2 for hydrogen atom 2, times the 1s wave function on hydrogen atom 2. Now, the coefficient on hydrogen atom 1 is positive, but the coefficient on hydrogen atom 2 is negative. This means that near the center of the molecular orbital, where the atomic orbitals overlap, there's a cancellation of the orbital density. So I'm actually going to rearrange this just ever so slightly and look at the orbital value along the x-axis. What happens with this is out near the edges we have a value of zero. That's why the orbital tapers off, because at some point the density gets below a threshold that's set by the computer. As we get closer to the nuclei, the density goes up and up and up until a point where it starts to decrease because of the destructive overlap between the two atomic orbitals. In the second lobe, it actually goes negative, and this is why we see a red color on this side of the orbital. And again, as we move farther from the nucleus of the second hydrogen atom, it tapers off towards zero again. This is a classic example of destructive interference and the point at the center of the molecule where we have zero wave function, where psi2 is equal to zero, this is known as a node. The most important big takeaway of this discussion for dihydrogen is that molecular orbitals are weighted sums, linear combinations, of the atomic orbitals. This means that we can see the atomic orbitals on the atoms of a molecule within molecular orbitals. For H2, since the only inputs are the 1s orbitals, this is pretty straightforward, and we can see how the coefficients dictate the sign of the wave function, which makes sense, as well as their size. These two coefficients are equal in magnitude to one another, so the two lobes are equal in size. You'll see these same patterns and ideas in more complicated examples. For example, here's a structure of methane, which has the formula CH4, with five atoms, the molecular orbitals of methane are going to be more complicated than those of H2, but the same basic principles apply that the atomic orbitals are scaled and added together to produce the molecular orbitals. So for example, we can look at MO1 here and see that there's basically a big blob of all the same sign of the wave function. So think for a second about what we should expect for the coefficients in the weighted sum, right? Keep in mind that in general we can describe this orbital as a sum over all of the atomic orbitals of some scale factor c times the wave function for that atomic orbital. What do you think are the signs, at least in a relative sense, of the c values for this first atomic orbital? If we look at the results of this calculation, we see that all of the signs for molecular orbital 1 are negative. Three orbitals have coefficients of zero. The p orbitals are not included. We can imagine that at the center of this MO, the orbital that's contributing from the carbon atom appears to be the s orbital, right? Since there's no, there's no, nothing that looks like a p orbital within this MO. And as we said before, you'll notice the atomic orbital shapes within molecular orbitals. That's the whole idea behind the LCAO MO approach. I'll just scroll through a few more of these MOs just to showcase them at the end of this video. Here we can see, for example, that this clearly has some contribution from the carbon 2p orbital, since this looks like a p orbital, right? If I imagine the blue density up here and the red density down here as the opposite phase, this looks like a p orbital centered on the carbon atom, and we should expect that to be a large contributor to this MO. Here's another example, and another example, and another example of molecular orbitals for methane. We'll see more examples of molecular orbital theory in a metals and materials context in class.